Sunday, Sunday, Sunday. June 27th, join us for Edupodlooza. There will be over a dozen Edupodcasters. Listen for some rhythm and rhyme. That's a poetry slam, boys and girls. Roundtable discussion. Just some teachers talking about teaching and laughing and having a good time. Role-playing games. Oh, yeah. For you nerds out there, you know you're going to like that stuff. Radio drama. Dum-dum-dum-dum. And really funny people. At least really funny looking, if nothing else. 1 to 9 on June 27th, Eastern Standard Time. We'll be live streaming. There'll be links. We'll put it on the Twitter. We'll make sure that you know where it is. Follow us at Unprocast if you're not already, because that's probably going to be the easiest way to know when it's going live. June 27th. Free up your calendar now. Thank you. Welcome to the Counter Narrative Podcast, a show designed to change the way we talk and think about education. By sharing stories of successes and triumphs, we aim to challenge the dominant narrative that often negatively portrays our disenfranchised populations. I'm your host, Charles Williams, an urban educator for more than 15 years, a current school principal in Chicago, an educational consultant, an equity advocate, and the co-host of Inside the Principal's Office. Let's get started. Before we jump into today's episode, I wanted to tell you about a super exciting event that I have coming up, and I would love for you to be in attendance. As I mentioned in the intro to the show, I am the co-host of Inside the Principal's Office, a web series that runs live on the first and third Saturday of each month. During the show, my co-host Michael McWilliams and I bring on other educational leaders and discuss the most pressing issues and topics facing us today. We also have a Facebook group where educators can connect and learn from each other. Well, this summer, we're planning to host an event where we can get together in person. That's right, not another Zoom or a Google Meet, but live. Even better, it's only $35. So join us in Dallas for a networking reception on Friday, July 30th, followed by a day of activities on Saturday, July 31st. Stop by our Twitter page, join us on Facebook, or check out an upcoming episode for more information. I look forward to finally meeting you. In this episode, I chat with Matthew Joseph, who currently serves as the Director of Curriculum, Instruction, and Assessment in Leicester Public Schools. He has been a school and district leader in many capacities in public education over his 27 years in the field, such as the Director of Digital Learning and Innovation, Elementary School Principal, Classroom Teacher, and District Professional Development Specialist. His Master's Degree is in Special Education and his EDD in Educational Leadership from Boston College. He is the author of the recently released book, Power of Connections, Connecting Educators, Cultivating Professional Learning Networks, and Redefining Educator Collaboration, as well as the book Power of Us, Creating Collaborative Schools. Matthew is also the co-author of Modern Mentoring, Reimagining Mentorship in Education. During our conversation, we talked about conflicting parallels that exist with educational leadership. We as administrators encourage teachers to adopt a growth mindset and to take risks in their classrooms, and yet we utilize punitive evaluation systems that often discourage the very behavior we would like to see. Matthew insisted that we need to develop a system that balances both accountability and innovation so that teachers can move from lessons to experiences and would be more willing to celebrate the attempts of their students as opposed to being focused solely on results. We also discussed the power of reflection to know oneself so that we can walk in our purpose. Ready to hear more? Well then let's go.
Hello and welcome back to the Counter Narrative Podcast. I am super excited for the episode that we have today. I have a good friend of mine who we have spent lots of time in lots of places and I really feel like I'm upping the caliber of my guests now and so it's pretty cool. I'm pretty uh, psyched about this. So today we have on the show a, a gentleman by the name of Matthew Joseph. You may or may not have heard of him but I'm sure, I'm sure that you have. Good morning, Matt. How are you? I'm psyched to be here, and I've just watched your work and, and, and you flourish, and I'm just thrilled to be now together on the Codebreaker team and also together, you know, collaborating on different projects. So I'm just psyched to be here and be a part of of your project. Yeah, it, you know, it's, I'll, I'll be honest, you know, it's kind of nice. To, I, I've watched you as I, I started in this realm, I guess, if you'll say, and I'm like, man, this, this guy's pretty awesome. And now that we get to do, you know, this work together from being on the summits together in the code breaker, you know, I, I got to contribute to your book. Like it's, it, it's been a phenomenal ride. And I, I look forward to where this journey is going to take us. Yeah. And, and I think when you bring people together that are, are driven, as I see that, that you are and, and have like aspirations to, to do more and give back. And I think for me, that's what's impress me about your work, the amount that you do for others, that you aren't self-promoting, you are promoting ideas for other people. And through some of the you know, webisodes that you do, your podcast, the writing, it's it's really, I gravitate to educators and leaders like that. Well, I appreciate it. I appreciate it. And you know, I, I would be remiss. I'm, I'm one of those uh, leaders who reflect on everything I do, everything I say. And so for those of you who have been on the show and who are listening and they're like, what do you mean you're upping the caliber? Please don't take offense to that. Um, so Matt, <laughs> I, I, I would love for, for the few individuals who may be listening who somehow have no idea who you are, if you could do me a favor, let's kick things off to share a little bit about yourself, your educational journey, and the part that I love the most, maybe something interesting about yourself. Sure. So um, for me, I grew up, uh, my whole career in life has been in Massachusetts. I grew up in Western Massachusetts, a little town called Pittsfield. And if you pick up the new book, you'll get a few of the MXJ origin stories from my days back as a youth in, in, in Pittsfield. And from there, I was a good student, not a great student, um, and went into uh, go into college and didn't know what I wanted to do. So I'm in working with my guidance counselor, it was something to support other people. And I went to Springfield College because they had athletics there, could do physical education, could do elementary education, we could work for the YMCA and just found my my path and passion at Springfield College because growing up with a single mother, when I was in elementary school, the male education teachers, which were very few and far between in the younger elementary grades, were a real impact on my life. So I said, that's that's how I'm going to give back. So I left, uh, graduated Springfield College and was an elementary school teacher for about 11 years, worked in third and fifth grade, and then saw that, you know, what I really wanted to do was support a school base of students and teachers and had the opportunity to become a principal and then was a principal for almost 11 years after that. So I really enjoyed that. I really enjoyed having that vision to craft a school, to work with a team. Um, and through that time, I had uh, the pleasure to study at Boston College and earn my doctorate degree there and just kept ramping it up and say, okay, now I want to take it a little bit larger and work in a district. And for the last five years, I've been a district leader in a few different capacities. One is director of innovation, which I really like to bring new ideas into schools, but I was missing the uh, instructional leader piece of that. So I transitioned into the director of curriculum and instruction and brought all of the innovation with me. And that's where I'm currently at right now. I'm the director of curriculum instruction and assessment in a district called Leicester Public Schools, which is close to Worcester, Massachusetts, about 40 minutes west of Boston. Awesome. As far as and as far as interesting, yeah. I think um, there's a lot of things that I, I, I could put up as, as interesting, both in personal, professional. I think one of the things that I would consider interesting, as your listeners may find useful at the same time, I have had the chance to write and be published in, in magazines and you know, a new book is coming out. I rarely write anything. I spend a lot of time using the translation tool in on the phone, meaning text to uh, speech to text. 
So I'll go up on walks. I'll go, you know, take my dog out for a walk and just speak an article or chapters of the book or different things. And then it has, and then I'll email myself and just kind of just do tweaks and edits. So I think professional interesting is the amount of writing and, and publications I've had, I've written like actually typed very little of it. Hmm. Matt, I think after the episode, I'm going to connect with you on that. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I have often said, you know, well, I, I'm in the shower in the morning and I'm like, re, I, I'm saying things out loud and I'm like, man, this is amazing. But I don't have one of those cool like shower notepads or anything. I was like, right. I, I need to be able to record this or or during my commute. Right. Thoughts are coming to me. And I was like, well, I can't just pull out a pen and, you know, notepad. So definitely going to pick your brain afterwards. <laughs> yeah. And, and, and because we have the pleasure of having each other's number and connecting afterwards, if any of the listeners are curious, I actually one of the tools I use is just Apple Notes on my phone and just hit the record and let it go. And it types it. And then I just hit send and email it to myself. And, and that came from leaving my time at Boston College, where it was much more academic writing. And it was okay, wasn't great at it. And I'm still not a great writer. But what I feel comfortable, the most comfortable is when I'm speaking to people, when I'm you know at an event or I'm running a session. So I just started to do that. And I know you and I have talked about preparing for, for running a sessions and we run through the whole thing. We say it out loud. So I tried to mimic that in writing that I do. So that's, that would be interesting. I think for some or some, they may be like, why would you do that? But for me, I think, you know, people often say, how do you have time to do the things you do? Uh, I think it's about being efficient on my, you know, 40 minute car ride to work. I could write an article by just talking out loud for 40 right. minutes yeah, I, I think you have just upped the time frame on my book. So, uh, thank you. <laughs> <There you go. laughs> but you know, I, I also just thought, you know, I couldn't help but to think about some of our students, right? Who who maybe are not strong writers, but they they can convey their ideas through their words, and so the possibility, as we talk about students having, you know, just multiple means of access, right? So if a student can sit there and say, "Hey, you know, what? I'm going to speak my essay." Right. And here you go, teacher. Right. Like it's like nobody said I have to sit down and write it as long as the skills are there. What does it matter how it happened? Absolutely. Because really an assessment is how are students transfer transferring information. Right. That's what yeah. we're learning wanting to see. And, you know, it's a great you were just saying and, and an example came into my head when I was in my master's program. I was, I have my master's in special education. So one of the programs was differentiated assessments, you know, similar thing. So I said, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to do what you just said. I, at the time I, we had, you know, I'm almost 50. So we had rec cassettes. So, <laughs> I, so I've been doing this a while, this talking thing. <laughs> so I wrote my paper, I did the assignment. I said, but I'm going to speak it into the uh, cassette to like show them what an alternate assessment is thinking like, wow, I'm really going to show them. So I do this, I hand in the cassette and the teacher doesn't listen to it and calls me in and said, you know, this was a serious assignment. Um, you're handing in a recording of you just talking. And I said, I have the paper, like I've done the work. And, and she gave me the highest grade. She was so like excited about that because she didn't think about it. Mm. And I'm not saying it because I think I'm, great or better than that teacher. But I think going back to what you said about students, we as educators have to open our minds a little bit or a little bit more and allow students to transfer that learning how they feel comfortable. If someone's a singer, let them sing. If they're a musician, let them write a song. And if we're measuring standards and assuring you know, students get the knowledge they need to matriculate to the next grade, well, if they show that, then then they, that works. Yeah, absolutely. You know, far in too my long. opinion, in my yeah, opinion, I'm no, not I, the commissioner of education in Massachusetts. I'm just saying in my opinion, <laughs> <laughs> you know, how many, how many times have we probably given advice where teachers are like, yeah, that's great. And it's like, I always tell people I'm sorry in advance, right? Because not everybody agrees with me, even though, right. There's a large portion of great educators who are like, no, this stuff works. But unfortunately there's, individuals in leadership were like, that is not how we do things here. Right. So I always tell people, I apologize in advance if you get in trouble, but you know, we're, we're, we're pushing education. 
Absolutely. I, and I say, I say have blind faith and that's my, the, you know, apologize in, in, in advance is a good one. And I like to say, have blind faith that this at the end will work out. <laughs> and, and, and I think that's why I liked the leadership role, the school leader role more than the educator. Cause I think if I looked at myself as a teacher, I'd be okay. I wouldn't be great. Cause I would always have these big units and this big grandiose thing. And it didn't fit the the needs, I think, at that that time. But going into leadership, I could plan things two, three months in advance. And that's where I would say the teachers have blind faith. And when we get to whatever month, you're going to see what this looks like. So I think that's why I like it. And, and I like what you're saying, giving teachers that grace, because that's where they're going to take risks. That's where they're going to try some different things when they know the leader uh, is, is behind them. So I, I know that it seems like, you know, maybe we've jumped into this a little bit already and that, and that's fine if we continue this down that pathway. But, you know, the the point of this conversation, right, I, I always want to try to identify ways in which people are pushing back, like what we were just talking about, challenging, you know, the narrative that often exists in education. And so I'm curious if you wouldn't mind sharing a way that either you or students or teachers in your district are really starting to reshape the way we view education? Sure. I think moving it from, from lessons to experiences is one of the big uh, steps that I've been trying to make in my district positions. Like, Let's move away from the, the day-to-day. Obviously, we have to plan. I'm not saying, again, I'm not saying I apologize in advance. I'm not saying that we shouldn't be having lessons and we shouldn't be having things, you know, structured. But what I'm saying is making an experience. We have as adult learners, we like to go and experience something and we take that away and we have a thought. We either are impacted by it, we like it, or we have a thought of why we don't agree with it or have some different thoughts. And we need to do that a little bit more with our students. So really shifting the way we're framing learning to experiences and celebrating attempts. That's another thing that I'm really trying to, you know, as you said, disrupt or do things different, that we so often get locked into the result, the end. And in this culture, look at any successful business. And I know school's not a business. However, it's one of the largest nonprofit businesses ever, like the amount that we spend on it. So why are we not mimicking startup CEOs? Why are we not trying? Why are we not celebrating attempts? Why are we not prototyping? I talk about prototyping a lot when we talk about shifting mindsets. Celebrate attempts, celebrate tries. I mean, think of anything that's incredibly successful. They didn't get it on the first shot. And we want something different in education. We want them to get it on the first shot. Mm -hmm. So it doesn't, it doesn't mirror real life. And as we know in education, if there's no relevance in it, there's no connection for our students. So the, the things that I'm to get back to your question is I'm really trying to shift from lessons to experiences. How are we creating a learning experience? Then I want to shift to celebrating attempts and, and, and having that will, will make the journey a little bit more exciting and make creation and discovery um, a little bit more exciting. And I think through that, just giving our students a voice, letting them talk about what they want, let them lead, let, let them say, I like this or, or, or I don't. I think when we do these things and we shift the, the onus of lesson launch, activity, closure, those are incredibly important, but it's very formulaic mm -hmm. that that's not how learning happens. Again, I'm nothing against skill for teacher or any of those. Th those are critically important. I'm, I'm saying these are like overlapping. They happen at the same time right. where we have to have structure and we have to have a direction. But it's okay that if the direction goes off the path, if it stays within the larger picture of learning. So, Matt, I, I know that you are in a position where you get to connect and, and speak with educators from all over and you get to touch, you know, their, their experiences and I'm sure that in those opportunities to connect, right, you've delivered some of these same ideas, these same messages. And so I'm curious, what are some of the challenges that you've encountered or the pushbacks that you've encountered? Because 
I think many of us listening are like, no, that makes absolute sense. And yet we don't see it as widespread as we should if that was the majority mindset. So I'm, I'm curious, what, what are some of those challenges? What are some of those pushbacks that you've, you've heard about or you've seen? So I think we're operating almost in two different you know, highways of, of, of this profession, where in one, we are pushing educators to try. We are, we hear growth mindset at nausea. We, we try, we want to try all these things. And then in the other lane, we're evaluating teachers every year. Mm. And, and that evaluation is such a, a stressor. And one of the things I had to continually assure my staff was that I'm not a snoopervisor. I'm not coming out trying to, oh, I got you. You weren't following. Oh, I, I got you there. And and I think you, in one of our talks, shared about moving from I got you to I, I've i got you. And I think that, that re really resonated with me because it really aligns with my thinking. So I think that the difficulty is balancing both our state testing that happens every year, the assessments that happen three times, four times a year, with the ability to be innovative. So I think that... I mean, we're, we're both in a leadership role. We both at one point were principals. It comes down to our leaders to, to build that culture of innovation. We hear innovation. We hear try these things. But what does it really look like? Is it a buzzword you read about or is it part of what we do? And I think moving forward, creating a culture of innovation is more than just trying something new. And allowing teachers to focus more on the journey will allow more of that um, innovative ideas, allow more of shifting mindsets. And I mean, colleges right now are moving away, are, are test optional. Mm -hmm. And we're a lot of our high schools, um, a big push is getting away from finals and having more project based. So I think a more you know, professional answer to what you asked is really trying to look at what does our culmination of learning look like? And if we have a culmination, like having a senior project versus a final exam, then we're going to mimic what life is. And when that happens, again, I talked about relevance earlier, then students buy in. I mean, they're 15, 16, 17 year old kids. They want to have some meaning and relevance than just because this 45 year old teacher told them to do something. You know, I can't help but think, first of all, first of all, I, I loved your your term snoopervisor, like. <laughs> that, that was great. Um, I, I'm, I'm sure we have all had a few of those in, in our experiences. Um, but, you know, I, as I listen to you, I, one of the other things I think about is this idea that people, they're afraid of the unknown, right? They're afraid of shifts, right? I, we have a system that is antiquated, right? It has been around forever. Absolutely. And people have built systems on this, right? They, they systems of wealth, systems of status, systems of everything. And when we start to say, what if we disrupt those systems, right? People get afraid, like, well, wait a second. What do you, what do you mean? Like if, if no, if everyone isn't going to be judged according to an ACT or an SAT score, suddenly you start to shift those dynamics. And I'm afraid that well, if they're as good as me, well, right, you can't have, I always say this, right, you can't have wealth without power, poverty, right? You can't have power without weakness. And so it's not necessarily about taking away, but it's about leveling. But those in positions that are higher are oftentimes afraid of what will I, in, in essence, be giving up, right? And they fight back and they push back because of that, that fear. Absolutely. And I know, and one of the things I love about listening to your show is it's, it's real. And I, and I like, to, and I like to be real. And, and when we talk about these things, and I think another piece, if you want to be real about it, people lose their identity mm. and it's a real, it's really scary for teachers. Meaning you've done something for 10 years. This is how I identify myself. I'm a second grade teacher. These are my projects. This is what's going to happen every year. Mm -hmm. It's safe. When you start talking about disrupting or shifting or moving or looping or anything that's going to break that social norm of how they've operated teachers, they're going to lose their identity because we, in my opinion, 
we haven't built up early on that we're educators. Our role is to educate students. My role as a principal is to, to ensure classrooms are as dynamic as the world around us. That's our role. My role is not a principal. That's my job title. My role is an educator to ensure students have the best education possible. That's what I do. And I think when we start shifting things, those who are not comfortable in that change culture get very nervous because, as you said, the, the, the line of what is good and excellent is going to shift. And they've been good for so long because they've done the same things. And I think not to talk pandemic, that was some of the, I think, issue with the pandemic. You've taken identity away from teachers. Not that they weren't teachers, but they're not standing in front of their class with their you know, teacher store posters up. Mm-hmm. They're in their own room or their own house, and they've lost that identity a little bit. And I think, as you say, in, in talking about changing and shifting, where I see it is not necessarily afraid of what's coming, afraid of what they're leaving behind. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's, it's, I mean, it is interesting. You know, I, I often, you know, just reflect, um, you know, in the school systems where I have always taught where I am now you know, versus the school system where, where my children have went to school, you know, and I tell my wife, you know, who is also a teacher, you know, if I were to evaluate their teachers utilizing the same expectations, the same tools, I said they would be deemed left and right, right? Where's the innovation? Where's this, right? There, there's, there's a teacher, an AP teacher who utilized the same project, right? I, my, my wife and I, we have five daughters, so when the last daughter is doing the same project that the first daughter did, right? It's like, wait a second. There, there's, we're still utilized, like you mentioned, but they've built their identity and success around the system that currently operates. They, they have wonderful AP scores, right? Wonderful SAT and ACT sure. scores. Um, and so I'm, I'm, I'm very curious, like, what will that look like as these shifts continue to change? And suddenly you are not, the only powerhouse, you know, in, in the, in the area. Um, so yeah, it's just, it's just me thinking out loud and it's really taking a closer look at, you know, what education is and and what we value. And, you know, so. No. And I think one of the things I, I often share either when I was leading a school or when I do principal coaching is one question. If you were to start over and you can start over, clean slate. Would you do it like you're doing it? Mm -hmm. And if it's no change now, like, like just change, like just boom, let's do this. Because if you don't like how you're running your RTI program, or if you don't like how you're running your drop off, if you don't like how you're running, whatever it may be, your special ed intake, if you wouldn't do it that way, when you started over, why are you doing it now? Mm -hmm. And I think having that you know, mindset is important, but there's a flip side to that, as you probably know, and and and, and I know, and, and I only say that because I don't know all of your your backstory. That being somebody who's a leadership change agent doesn't come with as many fanfare parties as you would think, <laughs> no. right? <laughs> because you are you're representing change, and that's scary. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you know it's. It's interesting. The other day, and and I know this may sound like the weirdest of examples, but I I was sitting (laughs) at a stoplight the other day and there's a cemetery there. And for some reason, they have this very dynamic like LED board that shows all types of things. And it's, I don't know, not common, I guess, for a cemetery. Um, But one of the things that was on there the other day was a quote uh, from Mark Twain about patriots, right? And it says that you are celebrated and hated, that you are, you know, revered and despised right when when you are trying but once you become a success or once that idea takes root in a hold then suddenly you know everybody is supporting you because now there's no risk right in, in being innovative and and I kind of sat there watching that while I was waiting for the red light and it's like yeah you know when you're in these places you get a lot of pushback or you get a lot of celebration but it is you're, you're you're challenging and upsetting, and you know we need to make decisions. Are we going to continue down that pathway, or are we going to shift our approach to to appease people? 
And it seems like in every episode, I'm like, look, if you're here for comfort, like you're on the wrong show. That is not right. You're listening to the wrong thing. There's (laughs) plenty of those, (laughs) you know? So yeah, I, I, I have, Love it. And, and so I have to ask, right? I'm sure there are, again, people are listening and they're, you know, Matt, Charles, what you're saying is great. I've heard this stuff before, but how do I do it? Right. Yes. Yes. We should be innovative. Yes. We should be creating experiences. You know, yes, there should be a balance of accountability and innovation. And that all sounds great, but where do I start? Where do I begin? And so I, I want to ask you that question. What if, if, Educators today could do one thing. What is one thing that you would recommend that they do? I'm going to give two, but it's in the same in the same realm. And one of the things that I've learned and, and had evolved over time is know who I am. Know the things I'm good at and can support others and can and lead, but also know the things that are gaps in my performance or, or needs, things that I could improve. Because when you know yourself and you lead or you teach as who you are, then everything you do is authentic. Mm -hmm. As I said earlier, the first thing we talked about is I don't think I'm a great writer in in the sense of taking a piece of paper and write or typing. So I found a way to adapt to to that. And I think teachers need to do or leaders need to do that as well. Once you know yourself, you can start making change and be authentic. I, I appreciate that, Matt. You know, I keep talking about this August Wilson quote that has resonated with me over the last few months. And it is exactly that, right? You got to be right with yourself before you can be right with anyone else. And so often we are quick to jump in and help others or just throw ourselves anywhere. And we really have to stop and take a look at ourselves. And I'm sure you're familiar with Ray from the Teach Better team. Yep. You know, she and I connected a few months ago and she asked me that question. She said, Charles, what is it that you're trying to do? Like, who are you in these spaces? Because that's, to be honest, that's what I, I was like, what do you need? Just tell me and I'm going to be your guy. You want, you want about discipline? I've got you. Data? I've got you. You know, because I, I was just so hungry and eager and I didn't ever stop to reflect and say, well, who am I? What is it that I value? What is it that I want to contribute to the world? And once I started down that pathway, obviously I was able to narrow that down and you become so much more impactful and meaningful. Well, then, you, yeah, I agree. And because you walk in your purpose, mm-hmm. you, you walk and talk in the things that you believe in. And, and, and as, an, as an early leader, one of the things I struggled with was I would do what the superintendent said as her. And if it didn't work, I would always be kicking myself like, ah, I wanted to try it this certain way. I want to succeed and I, and, and I want to fail as myself because then I know how to fix it. Then I know where to adapt. If I'm doing it like other people, then I don't know how to improve. Like I'm a, you know, I'm a 49 year old, going to be 50 soon, white male from Massachusetts. Somebody with the same background can't take the things that I say and do it like me either the things that do well or the things that didn't. I want you to learn from me and, and, and take it in. One of my really good friends, and, wrote, and he wrote the forward of my book, Basil Marin, we talk a lot about equity and, and voice. I can't lead like Basil. Like I can't lead like you. We don't have the same story. But what I can take from that is your experiences, your lessons, your teachings, your, your ideas, and I can translate them to me. And how would that look in my cadence? How would that look in my voice? What can I do? I mean, you know, Basil said a lot, you know, about a year ago almost, like amplify other people's voices. And I was like, okay, like I was asking how I can help. How can I be a part? Because I can't, you know, I, I don't have some of the history that, you know, other people do when we talk about equity and culture. And he said, well, amplify other people's voice. So I started out by having a podcast and then having the leadership lounge is like, how can I amplify others' voices? And that for me was critically important. And when you know yourself and know what you can bring, then you can have that change. Then you can really empower other people to follow you because they believe you because you're authentic. Well, and I want to say that I appreciate the opportunities that you are giving 
to amplify the voices of others. Um, I, I, I've definitely enjoyed being in those spaces. Um, and, and I think that this, right, even though I, I've brought you on, uh, you know, to amplify your voice, I, I've learned, you know, so much. And, and I'm hoping that our listeners, you know, are taking away from this. So I, I want to just say thank you for an, for an amazing episode. No, it's, it's always great to connect. So Matt, before we close out, we, we touched on it just like briefly, we, we've, you know, teased maybe in the beginning, you know, you, you referenced a book that you have and we just kind of kept it going. Um, but I, I really want <laughs> right. people to know about this book, um, you know, where they can find it, where they can, where, you know, where they can support the, the work that you've done. So can you take a few moments and just talk about sure. your, uh, your new book? Absolutely. And I, and I think, I hope that resonates that this wasn't coming on to promote something. This is who I am yeah. and, and, and I want to support. But in that, I have found to give back by sharing different experiences, as we talk about experiences that I have had. And the book is called The Power of Connections. It's from Codebreaker. But what it is, it's 13 chapters of different ways that we can connect and build a global PLN. I mean, you and I didn't know each other a year ago, mm-hmm. and now we've connected. I respect what you do. I'm part of your podcast, and we connect almost weekly. And it just shows how you can use Voxer, you can use Twitter, you can use EdCamps, you can use through fitness and other means to connect with other educators and learn. Charles and I were on a call today with an educator from Jordan. Often we have educators we connect with from different countries and just to get perspective. So the book is about gaining perspectives, getting out of our silos, even when you can't drive anywhere else, that there's avenues to connect and learn from other people like podcasts. You, I interviewed you about how podcasting has enhanced your you know, skill set and others. And there's so many ways out there that I want to showcase. And in and, and some of the book, people might read and say, yeah, I know this or know that. But as a whole, taking the totality of like, here's how we build them. I call it a PLN 2.0. It, the you know, professional learning networks look differently now. I have somebody from Australia, from Jordan, from Chicago, from wherever, that they look different. And I want to show how educators, leaders, individuals can improve their own abilities through these means and methods and to put the power and control in your hands. You have this ability every single day, 24 hours a day. And how are you going to use it? And as far as where to find it, yeah, yeah. I was um, going to say, don't it hasn't it hasn't know. come out yet, but it's hopefully out in the next week or two. Um, it'll be on Amazon. It'll be on the Codebreaker site. You can visit, and if you want to learn or get some free resources from the work that I've done, you can visit mxjspeaker.com or visit me on Twitter at Matthew X Joseph. One of those two things will connect you to everything else that's that's available. Awesome, awesome. And so again, listeners, if you have not already, as Matt says, the power of connections. If you have not connected with him yet. Please make sure that you do. You will learn. You will grow. Um, and that is what this is all about. So, Matt, again, I want to say thank you not only for the work that you are doing, you know, in Massachusetts and, and your connections across the globe, but just just for being an amazing leader and continuously challenging the narrative. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Well, thank you for doing the work you're doing and inspiring so many people uh, like myself in, in this field. I want to thank you for listening to the Counter Narrative Podcast. If you're enjoying the show, please be sure to like, subscribe, and of course, share it with friends and family. I'd also love to hear your thoughts about the show, so please leave a comment or two as well. Now, I'm not sure what platform you're using, but the show can be found on Anchor, Google Podcasts, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and plenty of other platforms. If the show isn't on your preferred site, let me know, and I'll be sure to get it up and running. This podcast is also featured on SchoolRubric.com, where you can find educational articles, videos, and interviews with educators from around the globe. Be sure to connect with me and other listeners by following the show on Twitter at The CN Podcast and joining the show's Facebook group. Take care.